One of the people providing the legal opposition to President Trump's executive order is Carl Racine. He's the Attorney General for the District of Columbia. He's one of 16 attorneys general who signed an amicus brief supporting the lawsuit against the president's orders. He joins us now from Washington. Mr. Attorney General, thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you very much for having so, me, Tucker. In, in, the, uh, in the ruling tonight, there was this line, and I'm puzzled by it. It says this, the government has not shown that the executive order provides what due process requires. Now, this order applies mostly to foreigners, non-U.S. citizens abroad. They're in other countries. The question, I think the key legal question here is, does due process as afforded by the Constitution apply to them? And if it does, it has massive implications for a lot of things. How could we ever bomb people in foreign countries, declare war on them, drone them, without giving them due process if they're due the rights the Constitution affords U.S. citizens? Does the court really mean to say that due process applies to foreigners in other countries? Well, I think the court's focus on due process was related to the impact of this executive order on immigration law. And clearly, with respect right. to due process, uh, due process applies to citizens in the United States, residents in the United States, as well as individuals who have applied and been granted visas. The court was very clear on that. So people in foreign countries who are not U.S. citizens, they're not on U.S. soil, but the constitutional protections that we enjoy as citizens apply to them. So would they have standing under the standard you've just articulated to file suit against the U.S. government on the grounds that say, I don't know, we bombed their country? So Iraqis with, with visas in hand, because our protections apply to them, why wouldn't they be able to sue in federal court in the U.S. for, I don't know, waging war against them? Sure, Tucker, your hypothetical is interesting. I think it is uh, a world away from the instant executive order related to immigration. The executive order related to immigration and the judge's ruling on due process made it clear that with respect to any person in the United States, citizens, residents, or folks who have been issued visas, whether they be in the states or not in the states, they are required under the law to be protected by due process, notice, and an opportunity to be heard. So there's nothing theoretical, <clears throat> but I beg your pardon, about the example I just gave. I mean, if they have due process rights, the same ones you and I as U.S. citizens possess, they don't, those rights do not just apply to the president's executive orders or to immigration. They apply to the whole panoply of rights granted us by the Constitution. That's a big deal. That means that tens of thousands, potentially millions of people around the world, not allowed to vote here, do not live here, have, the, have standing in U.S. courts as citizens. Like, why is that not a huge thing? Well, Tucker, it's because your uh, hypothetical is so expansive and goes so far beyond the court's narrow application of the question presented that it's simply inapplicable. Why don't we focus okay, on so the, the case and the contesting okay, of the executive so, so order? Th that's it. And I'm not a lawyer, so I'm just asking you a, a sincere question. So due process under the Constitution only applies to visas and immigration when those rights are curtailed by an executive order by the president. Well, that's what that's this it. Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals said. Okay. Okay, so explain to me, if you would, in simple terms, what's legally wrong with the president's executive orders? Why are they uh, against the Constitution, or what's the statutory problem with them? Sure. Uh, there are several uh, significant infirmities that the Ninth Circuit found. Uh, number one, uh, the, the government took the position that the executive order was unreviewable. Uh, the Ninth Circuit, citing cases going back to 50 years ago, made it clear that while a president's executive order that impacts national security and immigration is entitled to deference, it is reviewable under constitutional standards. That's point number one. Second point, second point, standing. The court made clear that states have standing to bring actions against the federal government where right. the federal government's actions will impact the states. And the states of Washington and Minnesota presented compelling evidence of the impact on students at universities, professors at universities, right. employees, and businesses. Okay, and that all seems reasonable, but I'm asking what's the core legal or constitutional problem with the orders in the first place? Why do they contravene the Constitution or existing immigration law? I'm confused about that. Okay, well, let me try to clear it up for you. Uh, what the court also found is that the rationale behind the executive order was not well established, in fact, by the government. The court pointed out and highlighted that in none of the seven countries at issue 
Uh, did the government present any evidence of any terrorist strike from those countries at the United, to, the, to the United States? Under the court's review, under the Constitution, the government needed to provide that evidence and wholly failed to. That's another very important fact here. Okay. So your position, because you signed on to this in the amicus brief, is that there is no threat from refugees or immigrants from, say, Somalia, even though there have been a couple of pretty recent cases where refugees from that specific country or their children have committed terror attacks or been arrested in terror plots. That's not real. There's no actual threat. It's made up. Is that the position? No, my position is, uh, and I heard the oral argument, which was an extraordinary right. teaching lesson in the Constitution, uh, and the judges asked the government lawyer uh, to provide it of evidence of any terrorist act from those seven countries. And right. as the opinion makes clear, the government provided no evidence. I noticed that that's exactly right. And that may have been a, a failure of preparation or a failure of sophistication. I mean, they clearly didn't do a good job defending their position. But I want to get back to what the core problem is. Now, you're hearing people argue that the problem with these executive orders is they specify, though indirectly, a religion. They it set up a religious test for our immigration policy. And that may or may not be true, but I'm struck by that argument because, of course, we have had explicit religious tests for immigration policy pretty recently. Up until 1988, September of 88, the U.S. government automatically granted refugee status to Soviet Jews because they were victims of persecution. And by the way, they were. And so we automatically gave them refugee status because of their religion. Was that a bad thing to do? Well, uh, you know, I, I haven't really thought about that example, and I certainly don't think it was a bad thing to do because, as you know, uh, the, the Soviet Jews were being persecuted. Big time. Right. So why would it be a bad thing to carve out special status for Middle Eastern Christians who are the subject of genocide? And they are. No one, no one disputes that. What, what's the difference? Well, this order did not do that, as you know. What this order did and that what the court found was that there was evidence not only in the order but outside the order, statements by the President of the United States, statement by, state, state, statements by his aides, that the order, in fact, uh, was discriminatory to a certain religion and, and, and therefore elevated religion in a way that is counter to the Establishment Clause of the Constitution. Right. But as I just said, of course, we've done this before and no one said anything. There is a precedent for singling out people on the basis of their religion for special treatment in our immigration law. And, and yet this is somehow different and you haven't explained why. And the other uh, example that people bring up is that somehow this is wrong to specify or bar people by country of origin, and yet, of course, our immigration policy, by definition, categorizes people by country of origin. The 65 Immigration Act is all about country of origin. We're going to take this many from this country, this many from this region. And that, of course, has not been found to be unconstitutional. So why is this unconstitutional? Well, the 65 uh, Immigration and Nationality Act specifically indicates that while, of course, the government can make decisions on the number of individuals it admits from a country, it cannot discriminate wholly on the basis of national origin. That's been the law since 1965. It's not been contested. And again, if you read the Ninth Circuit opinion, you'll see that the Ninth Circuit, an ideologically diverse court, a very important point, unanimously ruled with the states and against the government's arguments, many of which that you're making tonight. But wait, I mean, I, I, I understand the talking point, but that's just, not, that's just not true. I mean, the Immigration Act of 1990, which was like yesterday, basically, 27 years ago, created a diversity visa dedicated to channel immigrants from countries with, with low rates of immigration to the United States, which is to say it gave favor to some immigrants based on national origin and disfavored others based on national origin. This is our current law. So I don't understand why these executive orders are inconsistent with this precedent. And no one has explained that to me. Well, and I've got to tell you, uh, Tucker, I, I appreciate your creativity and certainly appreciate your hypotheticals. The Department of Justice... That's not hypothetical, come, it's the law. The, let me just make the point. Your Department of Justice did not make any of the arguments that you made. Uh, the Ninth Circuit and the federal court before it evaluated the executive order under well-established principles of the Constitution. And at every instance in the Ninth Circuit, they found that the government's arguments were unavailing. That's the point. 
Yeah, but it, do, it doesn't get to the court. I mean, for, for viewers at home wondering what's legal, what's not, what's constitutional, what's not, you've made the case that they made a bad case, and I agree with you, but you haven't explained what the constitutional principles are at stake, and I still don't understand them, unfortunately. Okay. And we're out of time, and I, I wish we had more time. I look forward um, Carl, to talking to you again. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thank thanks, you. Tucker.